Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dr. Greg Jones Optimization Academy where I get to interview some of my favorite innovators in health, medicine, fitness, and beyond. It is our pleasure today to welcome Darina Bledsoe. Darina Bledsoe, hey Darina. Uh, Darina is a local uh, uh, native of Arizona, which is rare in these day and age many ways, and has family roots in Spain or España if you want to get fancy about it. Uh, There you go. (laughs) She was a uh, point guard, uh, NCAA point guard, division one. So she will break your ankles and then help nurse you back to health mentally after you've been embarrassed on the court. Um, After graduating, she continued her academic career at the University of Northern Iowa where she earned a Master of Arts in Clinical Psychology. She came back to Arizona, where she practices counseling for clients suffering from various psychiatric disorders. She's she's a National Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapist, and she is EAGALO certified, EAGALA certified, make sure I get that right. She specializes working with Spanish-speaking populations, very needed. And her coaching is a mixture of education regarding mental health, wellness, while focusing on the performance mindset. And so if you're wondering why she's here, you know I'm about optimizing, you know I'm about performance, so this is a great match here. And so Dorena's career in coaching began working with behavioral health providers seeking a resilient mindset, super important right there, has expanded to working with athletes and people in leadership. She's a business owner, an entrepreneur, a mindset coach, a behavioral health professional, a motivational speaker, an, ar- an author, and a former athlete. Got all the titles. And you got alphabets behind your name. I didn't even want to start with that. So, Narita yeah. Bledsoe is MA, LAC, NTF, and CBT. So, like, mm. yeah, take that, y'all. Take that. All so, that. Th- that being said, welcome to the show. Darina, how are you? Thank you. Thanks for welcoming me. I'm doing really well. I'm super excited to talk mental wellness with you and so many ways that we're impacting our community out here in Arizona. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. So that being said, how did you get from the basketball court to the couch? And the couch, not on the couch, not like you're sitting down, not doing anything like you're okay. My bad. Okay. Let's say it again. You're not on the couch. Mm -mm. Your patients are on the couch. They're on the couch and I'm right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So computer. let's rephrase in that, that how did you get from the courts to the chair with your lovely clients on the couch? You know, it, it came with a lot of up, ups and downs and just trying to navigate what I wanted to do long term. And I thought that was going to be basketball when I was playing. But after a couple of injuries and some some heart to heart discussions about the future in sports, um, I quickly realized that I needed to focus on a higher education And so I don't like blood, so I couldn't be a doctor in terms of a medical provider like you, right? Um, I don't, I'm not big into uh, personal training or touching people's bodies. So then it went to the mind. And so I was really into pursuing my doctoral degree in psychology. And I learned within my first year of graduate school that I was a very efficient and effective therapist. So I decided that was the route I was going to take. And that was out in Iowa. So once I got my master's degree, I ran back here to Arizona, escaped the cold, and have embraced the heat. <laughs> and ever since then, I've been out here. It's getting closer to about 10 years of practicing in the field, and it's been such a fulfilling career. I can imagine. I can imagine. So <clears throat> here's a question, and I love asking this question to fellow providers, not so much on camera, so surprise. Um, how did you feel your very first patient? No, not a student. They're right in front of you, first one on your own. Do you remember that experience? Yes, I do. And I was working in one of the toughest facilities ever in my life. It was an eating disorder facility, and it was an inpatient Mm -hmm. level of care. And I actually had been hired as a float therapist. I was just supposed to help all the primary therapists. And within two weeks, they were like, you're a primary therapist. You're going to be running groups. You're going to be dealing with people on feeding tubes, on J tubes, all of this stuff. They're decompensating in front of me. And I remember this pressure and this weight of somebody's life is in my hands. I could be their decision maker of whether they continue living a fulfilling life or they die. And so I just remember being scared for the first few months of doing that position. And then I had to learn a hard lesson that I can't save everybody, right? It's our decision. It's my decision if I want to live. And it's also my decision if I want to continue living. And so that was my, that was a pretty hard lesson to learn in the field, but it has helped me tremendously in my professionalism. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my first patient cussed me out, so you did better than me. I, okay. um, yeah, and it wasn't like in a bad way. It's just because I didn't really at that time, you know, it wasn't my practice. And I was like, oh, you know, we're going to do all these things, all these things. And the bill came and it was super high. And they're like, you didn't tell me that. And it was really bad. And I'm just like, oh, well, you know. And that's, that's rough because it wasn't about the medicine, you know, and that's understanding that, you know, being able to have that conversation about what you can offer and, and being open and upfront about that. It was a lesson for me because everyone is not in the means because as a naturopath, we're in a mostly cash-based professional medicine. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you drop a big bill on someone and that, they won't be happy unless they're expecting it. So having that conversation up front, even before they get in the door, like this is what to expect and all that. So that they're already in that mindset, because that was a, it's hard, especially as a practitioner, your first patient, you're like, Mm-hmm. oh man it's me it's gotta be me you know am I not you know and you self doubt like am I not worth this and all that but I've quickly gotten over that and understanding that you know there's a balance between meeting people where they are not just in health but also financially and be able to offer solutions depending on what they can do you know Absolutely. so that was important for me so, so I get it so you know that's a, a big part of it as well mm-hmm. now when it comes to mental health and we were discussing this before we got on the line is that sometimes I think that there is this I don't want to say misunderstanding, but this may be misnomer and this blending of three terms, mental illness, mental health, and mental wellness. So from your perspective as a professional, what or other, how would you define those three? So I, I think you bring up a really good point in the confusion it can cause um, and how we tend to merge these terms together. And so that's a big part of, of the education that I give when working with my clients is being able to embrace your mental wellness because we all experience mental something. Um, and so I think this is a nice breakdown. So mental wellness is, is a state of being, right? Most of us want to feel well, but nothing is really perfect in this life. And so we understand that if we want to be well, we need to invest in our wellness. We have to focus, we have to place time into it. We need to place our energy into actually improving our emotions, connecting with them and really better understand understanding our thoughts and our behaviors um, and how it helps us move in the world. So for me, if, if I want to continue feeling a state of calm, right, this well-being of calmness, then I have to do something that contributes to that. And for me, it's typically journaling. And so um, it, I think this is kind of a nice segue into the journal that I've been using which my sister and I created, it's called Empowered AF. And this has been something that's helped me intentionally invest into my wellness. So that's, that's the mental wellness um, part of it. Now, mental health is something a little bit different. Mental health really focuses on a change in your, in your state, right, in your condition. So we, we hear things like physical health and what's going on with your physical health, but we don't talk on, enough about mental health. Um, mental health means experiencing emotions like anxiety and sadness, which we all experience, but it's at a different strength and frequency. And so whenever a client comes in, um, especially if I'm providing treatment like counseling to them, I always ask them, how long have you been feeling like this for? And if the duration is longer than 30 days and it's causing some some sort of dysfunction in one's life, whether it's at work, at home or in relationships, then we start to say, okay, there's something going on with your mental health that you need assistance and support and guidance in addressing a little bit more. So, um, so mental wellness is something that we typically kind of take care on our own um, or use others like family or friends or resources in the community to address. Whereas mental health, we start to see a combination of both our personal resources like family and friends, in addition to working with possibly a mental health professional or a mindset coach. Hopefully so far that's making some sense. Yeah. No, it it really does. And, you know, and I related to a lot of the things we do in the clinic here where there's health and there's wellness. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at it from a perspective of health being the absence of illness, nothing wrong with that. That's cool. That's great. I mean, I'd rather you be healthy than ill and sick, but when we talk about wellness, we're talking about feeling great and feeling optimized and being able to, you know, have energy and feel vibrant and feel that, vital force within you that's like, hey, I'm motivated to keep going and I can do the things I want to do in the absence of 
pain or slowing down or not wanting to do it. So I think there is a great correlation there. And the goal is wellness, you, mm-hmm. you know, and just think of, think of health is you, you got to have health to have wellness in many ways. Mm-hmm. So it's a stepping stone to that, or it's, it's on the pathway to that. So I definitely can appreciate how you were able to explain that, you know, so now that being said, and I know you work with a lot of athletes and a lot of people in leadership business position, uh, business positions of leadership, we're going to add to that. So I know you work with a lot of athletes and a lot of yeah. people in leadership positions. How does shifting gears a little bit, how does stress and anxiety affect performance in those arenas? man, it can, it can affect performance in so many different types of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, So especially when talking about like mental performance or your mindset performance, um, we see a lot of things like doubt. We see second guessing, we see anxiety, a lot of anxiety that can happen. um, Whether you're, you're on the field, you're on the court or any type of of environment where you have to perform at a high level. And so, um, it, especially speaking of myself personally. So I played basketball in college and I remember I would have the worst bouts of anxiety. I'd be shaking. I wouldn't be able to hear the crowd yelling and cheering because my anxiety levels were so high. And I didn't realize what I was experiencing until my coach had to sit me down. I mean, I'm a point guard. I have to lead. I have to tell everybody where to go. I'm calling out plays. And there were games where I would just be stuck. Hmm. Couldn't hear my voice couldn't think clearly, was clouded. And I remember my coach had to sit me down and talk to me about, you know, hey, I noticed that during this game, you know, it really came down to the last few minutes and you were a deer in headlights. And he told me, you know, it looks like you're really dealing with some stress or some anxiety surrounding this pressure. And that's when it clicked. It made a lot of sense. So he taught me ways to work through this, like listening to some loud music just before a game, singing as loud as I can to get that pressure out physically and emotionally. And so that's what we tend to see with the athletes is that they're forgetting the skills that they do have when they're in those moments of pressure due to their performance. And so there's a lot of ways to to implement skills in those moments, but I think oftentimes we forget that there are solutions because we as humans, we focus on the problem. We focus on the barriers, the limitations, and then we feel trapped and stuck and we're deer in headlights. Gotcha, gotcha. And interesting enough, because when I think about high level athletes or people in high level, high levels of leadership, stress comes with the gig. It does. Because of the responsibility you have, mm-hmm. you know, so you're going to have the stress it's a matter of not turning that stress into anxiety, which that's the, they both can be debilitating the anxiety, you know, transition from stress. I think that's where it gets really rough where you're, you, know, you have the pressure of succeeding and, and performing and now you can't, and now you're worried about, okay, what's the next step after that? It becomes like this circle of doubt, as you said. Right. So that being said, and we're going to look at two sides of that coin. So you, you started to talk about it here in the beginning, about coping with that stress and pressure in the moment. Now, just circling back to something you spoke about earlier about working with you know athletes and yourself as an athlete and dealing with that stress and anxiety in the moment. And something when we were kind of creating our outline was discussing about how coping with stress and pressure in the moment is a form of empowerment because you know that no matter what comes at you, you can get through it because you have these skills and the ability to do it. So for you, with sports, you mentioned, you know, the singing loud and listening to loud music. What are some other coping mechanisms to help that you recommend that people use to deal with stress and anxiety in the moment? You know, the the number one thing, and I feel like every provider encourages this, breathe, breathe, breathe. Mm -hmm. Literally, taking a deep breath has so many physiological benefits to it. It actually, there's, there's so much research that shows it's going to slow down your thoughts. It's going to slow down your body. You're going to experience a calmness throughout your body as well as in your mental space. So oftentimes um, people forget that when their anxiety or their stress is starting to rise, there's this thing called adrenaline that boosts throughout our body and it's, and it's meant to speed everything up right and the 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 good part about it 
is that it creates that drive or that sense of urgency, right? Where we do things like focus on the target. Um, adrenaline is actually meant to something as a, for our survival state, right? And so um, it can really overwhelm us and put us in this position where we're in confusion or we're blurred, right? Our vision is blurred. We're not certain what to do or what type of decision to make. And oftentimes that's when I say breathe. If your body is physically responding to stress by a boost in adrenaline, then you need to do something physically to calm yourself. So we do the opposite of slowing down, taking a deep breath. And oftentimes we don't have to reach for a tool or a device to help us cope. We just need to remember to breathe. Breathing's good. I can deal with that. You know, second deep breaths. Now, is there a, you know, when it comes to coaching deep breaths, is there like a count to it, like three in, one out? Like, what do you normally recommend to people? So, so it depends. It depends because some people that have breathing difficulties or issues, um, whether it's due to asthma, COPD, bronchitis, anything like that that's actively going on, I tell them usually start with one deep breath. And then whatever number they're able to reach, that's going to be the number we're going to continue focusing on. Now, with, with anxiety, um, there are other ways of practicing fun breathing activities, and one is called bumblebee breathing. And this is really helpful for, for anxiety because what you do is you take a deep breath in through your nose, and when you breathe out your mouth, so typically it's about like four seconds through your nose, and then when you breathe out, you buzz like a bee. So it's... Bzzz. And people typically will start laughing because it makes them feel silly. It's a nice distraction from the negative emotions or the intense pressure that we're starting to notice come up for us. And also, it's a nice physical grounding tool. And grounding means kind of bringing you back to this moment by using one of your five senses. And in this situation, it would be physical, right? Tactile, where we're noticing the vibration of our mouth. So that's kind of a fun way of using a breathing technique. Awesome. That is awesome. Now, now transitioning that, because we know there's that stress and that pressure of performing in the moment. Yeah. Then the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is coping with that stress in the future, so to speak. And, and if you didn't understand where we're going through the outline, what I was going to talk about was like, okay, because there's that in the moment, this is happening right now. But then right. there's that thought of, oh, God, oh God tomorrow I got a big meeting. Tomorrow, I got a big game. Tomorrow, I got a big competition. And it's not right in front of you. And it may be two days from now, maybe three days from now, but it's in the future. It's not happening to you right now. Mm -hmm. And this goes into that concept of being resilient, right? And not letting things in the future affect what you're doing right now, or even in the past, if we want to go there, because sometimes you can get triggered by things that happen in the past that will kick up your stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. What are those techniques, if they're different, that you recommend that people use to cope with that? So, so this is kind of a little bit more challenging because there can be various factors that contribute to you focusing on the future, right? Like you mentioned, it could be the past, which is now affecting our present because we're looking too far ahead in the future. Um, it could be something in terms of time frame. It's supposed to happen in less than 24 hours or within the next hour, right? So we, we've used certain types of techniques depending on the situation. The number one thing I, ta I tell my clients when I, noticing, I notice they're focusing too much on the future is you're not there yet, right? Miss Cleo is the only one that can predict the future. So we don't have to take on that responsibility or that pressure. We're not there yet. So instead of future tripping, let's do some future planning. So what can we do right now that's going to promote your future self, right? What can we do right now that you can thank yourself in the future for, right? And so um, if it's a situation where, you know, like you mentioned, oh my gosh, I have this big project tomorrow, then ask yourself, what is it that I can do right now to get closer to preparing for this project? And it might be stopping what you're doing right now to focus on the project, right? Um, but it differs from person to person. If I'm a parent and I have kids, I can't just stop working with my kids to focus on this project. I may need to ask for help right? And reach out to somebody else. Or I might need to do something like get a calendar, right? Get some things to remind you of the things that are coming up so that you're not feeling this extreme pressure to scramble and accomplish a goal. Um, uh, there's, there's a saying that I remember a Marine buddy of mine used to say, I think it's poor performance prevent or perfect planning prevents 
poor performance, something like that. Um, the Marines will know what that saying is. But um, I remember she would say that and, and it was really, it really impacted me in such a good way that I started sharing this type of perspective with my clients because if, if you're not preparing ahead of time, then you can expect poor performance. Well, I was Navy and we said something similar, but I heard some of that stuff and basically it would be that proper proper planning prevents his poor performance. So there you go. That's, <laughs> that's, it. It. that's still there. Way it's right yeah. there. Re recall that at the moment's notice. So <laughs> that, that's awesome because again, we do know that sometimes the things that stressed us, stressed us out in the past, things we're worried about in the future can affect our current performance like right here, right now. And that's very important. It's important to know, you know, and being able to work ourselves through that and understand like what our triggers are. Now, something that, you know, me as a doc, as a naturopathic physician, and I talk to, because again, a big part of what I do when I'm talking to my patients is like, I don't just want to know what you're eating, you know, and your exercise, how much water you're drinking and what supplements you're taking. But I want to know what your stressors are, because that will affect, and you mentioned cortisol earlier, it will affect that and that has an effect on your health all the way around you know so but the thing is is that i love having these conversations with people like yourself with professionals like yourself because i'm very very good at, as a doc as working with the physiological responses for stress like how do i support your adrenal glands you know how do we work to improve your sleep how do we work because stress affects gut health right so how do i improve your gut health so but these are tools Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm very upfront with my patients about that. Like, I can give you the tools. The transformation comes from you. You know, so I can do all these things, but if you do not find a way to cope, eliminate, manage, mitigate, oh. whatever term you want to use, the source of the stress, mm -hmm. the minute you stop taking said supplement or said treatment, there's a high probability you're going to start feeling bad again. Right. And so... It's just understanding that piece of like use these things as as tools, but the transformation starts with how you see the world around you. Uh -huh. And so and this is good. I, and I don't know how, you know, well, how do you discuss that with your patients, the tools versus transformation? So so a big part of it is really them being able to identify what their current tools are. And I know when we were talking earlier, you mentioned Sometimes your clients will say, like, I don't have any tools. And that's not true. They probably have never been asked that question before. What are your tools? So the first part is being able to identify what you already have. And then how often you're actually using the tools. So let's say one of my tools is journaling. And it's something that I used to do. I had such a passion for it back in the day. And I just lost touch with it because life got busy and I had to keep up with life, right? Right. So oftentimes I'll say, well, can you schedule five minutes in your day to engage in journaling or engage in the skill that you used to find beneficial for your stress? And usually that's the first step in being able to identify what the stress mechanism is. From that point, after a little bit of time, because like you said, we got to give you some time to use the tools that we're giving you, like a supplement, right? We don't know how effective it's going to be until we have that follow-up to see what's happened over that duration of time. So when we do the follow-up, we always talk about what did you notice? What went well and what could have gotten better for you? And usually we hear things like, oh, you know, life took, took advantage. I forgot about the skill. And so we have to revisit what is the goal? right? What is the purpose of, of working towards this goal? If your goal is to control your stress, what are you willing to do to meet that goal? And, and oftentimes it, we have to allow a person to fail, right? Because it's not necessarily failing, but we have to let them fall in order for them to recognize they do have the power to pick themselves up and get back on track. Right. And so um, it's, it's one of those, you know, I always tell folks, I'm always transparent, you know, um, to get to a place of healing, we do need to get through some pain, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, once they start learning how they're contributing to this pain, right? They're taking accountability for the pain that's being created. Then we start to see that empowerment. Then we start to see the resiliency really and the confidence just pouring out of them that they lost touch with that they used to have. Oh, that's awesome. I like that. I can appreciate that. <laughs> so, I know, I know. Well, looks like our dime's up. 
about that time. So I know, right? It went fast. It went so fast. It did. I what know. a good time. Mm-hmm. No, it, no, and I appreciate it. And I, I'm very humbled and very honored again that you took the time to come on the show and talk a little bit about the techniques and tools that people have available, especially if they're trying to improve performance and be well mentally. And that's important, you know, yes. so because you want to be a whole person, you want to not just be all about one part of your life and have all these things together. So that being said, how do we find you? Okay. So there's a couple of ways. Um, if you're on social media, then on Instagram and Facebook, it will be Empower El Mundo. And like Dr. Jones mentioned, I do like working with my Spanish speakers, España. So Empower El Mundo. El Mundo means the world. And the mission is to empower the world. Now, the other part is through our podcast, which is under Empower El Mundo. And for those that are big journal people like me, you can go on our website at bloodstoneempower.com and get your order of the Empowered AF Journal. All right. Shout out to you for the product placement. I love how it was like right there. It was ready. Just pop it up right there. So taking orders, <laughs> taking orders right now, people taking orders right now. All right. Awesome. Awesome. And then, so we got your website. We got the podcast. We got ways to follow you on, on social media. So for everyone out there that wants to know more about the mission of Coach Darina, and your sister is, is two is two of you guys. Yeah. Right? It's like, yeah. Are you twins or? No, we're we are two years and three days apart. All right. I, it looks like twins. I was like, okay, they got twins here. This is all good. It just <laughs> happens. It just happens. So, yeah. but thank you again. I really appreciate the time. I appreciate you know the information that you've imparted on us today, and hopefully we can have you back again soon and continue this journey. Thanks again, Darina, and we will see you soon. Bye. Mm-hmm.